Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. And Unity 6.3 has just come out in beta. This is actually a pretty important version because it's the one that is going to be the next LTS version. In case you don't know how they recently changed how their versions work. So right now you've got an LTS version, you've got support, and of course you've got preview versions. And for this cycle, for the Unity 6 cycle, for this there's Unity 6, that is the current LTS version. Then 6.1 came out as support, which has since been replaced by 6.2. So as of right now, the function you probably should be using right now is 6.2. Even though 6.0, that LTS, that is still perfectly fine. And in the future, eventually we will have 6.3. And that one will eventually become the LTS, and by being LTS, that means it is support for the next few years. So 6.3, this one is going to be the next LTS version, and this one, the beta, has just come out. And over here, there's no mention of when it will be leaving beta, but if I had to guess, I would say this one is probably going to hit LTS by the time Unite rolls over. So that is Unity's yearly conference, it will be happening in Barcelona later this year on November. So if I guess from around that time, the LTS version will be out. And this one actually has a bunch of interesting things. First of all, they are continuing to improve on UI Toolkit. This is their relatively new UI system. So basically right now you've got IM GUI, you've got Unity UI, and you've got UI Toolkit. And they are trying to get UI Toolkit pretty much in parity with Unity UI. One thing that it was missing was customizable UI shaders, so they added it in this version. Then as well, UI post-processing filters, as well as adding support for SVG files. So if you want to make awesome UI stuff, then this can be quite useful. Adding shaders, you can do all kinds of interesting things. You can really just go in the shader graph, then go under URP, and you can create a brand new UI shader graph. Then your project, you can just right click, create a brand new UI toolkit, create a brand new UI document. And then over here, you can open up this one. And on the UI builder, over here, you can select some kind of visual element. And over here on the right side, now you see this field for the material. So up here, you can select the material that is using a custom UI shader. Then the other awesome thing is also this one, so post-processing filters. It's actually a really interesting one, how you can add all kinds of post-processing on top of your UI. So you can take the exact same UI and make it look very, very different. So you can have like the original, you can tint in some kind of color, you can make it all transparent, you can make it inverted, you can lower the desaturation, or of course you can make it nice and blurry. For these, yep, just go create a brand new UI toolkit, then create a new filter function definition. So over here, right click, create a new UI toolkit, a filter function definition. And then this is a scriptable object, you can give it some kind of name, give it all kinds of parameters of all kinds of types, and all kinds of passes using any materials, any shaders you want. Or for a more simple use case, you can really just open up the UI builder, and over here on the right side, select some kind of visual element. Then over here, go under filter, click on the plus icon, and you've got all kinds of pre-built filters. So you can tint, you can add the opacity, invert, grayscale, blur, and so on. Then 6.3, this one also adds something interesting, so we're in the 3D as 2D. So these are enhancements to 3D renderers that can be displayed with depth or 2D starting rules while maintaining full compatibility with 2D lighting. So this one sounds a bit strange, but basically you can take 3D elements and apply sorting layers, sorting orders, sorting groups, basically the same way that you can do with all kinds of 2D elements. So you can have some kind of fully 2D game, and in that fully 2D game you can have 2D lights and so on, and then you can put inside the game, you can put some 3D elements, sort them using the same sorting order, sorting rules, and then they are affected by 2D lights and all sorts of things. So if you want to mix 3D elements inside your 2D game, now you can do that. Whereas previously, if you were to put a 3D object in the middle of a 2D scene, it wouldn't be affected by 2D lights, none of that, so it could look very strange very off. Whereas nowadays, if you want to do this kind of style of having mostly a flat 2D game, but incorporating some nice 3D meshes in some points to make it look nice and stylized, if so, now this will be much easier to make those 3D elements look like they fit within that 2D scene. So basically, the 2D renderer itself, that one now supports rendering mesh renderer and skin mesh render components using the 2D URP workflows. So they can receive lighting from 2D lights, they can interact with sprite masks, and be sorted with sprites. In order to do that, they just need to use a compatible material. So there's apparently a brand new material, the mesh 2D and lit default. So over here, if I create a brand new material, and over here on this one, on the shader, go down into URP, go into 2D, and up over here are the two new built-in shaders, so mesh 2D and lit or unlit. Or alternatively, if you want to make your own custom shaders, if so, then inside shader graph, under the graph settings, you just have to go and toggle this one, sort 3D as 2D compatible. Then another change in the 6.3 beta is on Shader Graph. So this one now has a new template browser. So over here, if you right click, go under Create, go under Shader Graph, and over here, yep, it's the From Template. And this one, yep, there's this nice new template browser. So here you can see a bunch of nice templates for you to start with. Start with a completely empty Shader Graph. Start with built-in Lit Basic, Lit Basic, Lit Fool, and Lit, and so on. So you have just some bunch of nice templates for you to start, so you don't have to always start just from an empty Shader Graph. If you already know you're going to do something with decals, just start with this one. And like it says here, so any shader graph asset can be designated as a template in the asset inspector. So if you want, if you have your own custom game with lots of custom shaders, if so, you can basically define some of those shaders as templates. So when you want to create some variations from those, you can start from those and then build upon it. They also added shader graph support for terrain shaders. I didn't know this was not possible, but apparently not. I haven't really used the terrain too much. So that's great and apparently supports AGRP and URP, includes a new subtarget type for new node for loading terrain data. Next up on multiplayer, so they added HTTP2 support. So this is really interesting. As far as I know, HTTP2, that one ends up being quite a bit faster in a handful of cases. In theory, it is a significant upgrade. 
So I do wonder if just by doing this change, I do wonder if multiplayer games made with Unity, if those are going to be pretty much faster by default. If so, that's definitely an awesome thing. Just by using the new version with new tool set, hopefully you get fewer latency. And something really awesome is this one. So host migration for netcode for entities. So this is really awesome. So you can basically have player host games. And when the host disconnects, the game doesn't actually die. It just moves the host onto another client, then continues. However, sadly, this one is only available for Netcode for Entities, so there's no mention over here of Netcode for Game Objects. In case you don't know, those are the two Unity multiplayer tool stacks. I have free course on both those, so one on making a multiplayer game using Netcode for Game Objects, another one on making that same game using Netcode for Entities. Both are very interesting. I quite like Netcode for Game Objects, how it's just so easy to use. Whereas Netcode for Entities, this one requires a bit of knowledge about how dots work, so it's quite a bit more complex, but also quite a bit more capable. So over here, the fact that they're adding this feature, this highly request feature, just in Netcode for Entities, it actually makes me think if they are planning on basically building Netcode for Entities for the future, and then the future basically just have one multiplayer tool set. They basically just have Netcode for Entities, and they basically have two layers on top of that. So one for hardcore, so pretty much how Netcode for Entities works nowadays, and one for much simpler use case, basically how Netcode for Game Objects works nowadays. I wonder if that's what they're planning to do. So have a complex and a simple approach, but all of those built on top of the same tool set. That way they can just keep working on this one tool stack instead of making the same work on both of them. And then both those layers of abstraction, both those get all those benefits. Maybe that's the plan. Maybe that's what they're trying to do, basically merge both those multiplayer tool stacks in one. But as of right now, if you are making games using Netcode for Game Objects, if so, then basically you need to handle host migration yourself. But if you're using Netcode for Entities, then thankfully now you get that awesome feature by default. Another interesting one in the 6.3 beta is native desktop screen reader support. This is an interesting one, definitely something that I've never used myself but basically extends the platform coverage for the screen reader API beyond Android and iOS. So it makes it possible for you to build apps and games that are accessible to screen readers across all major platforms supported by Unity. So apparently those are Narrator, VoiceOver, TalkBack, and VoiceOver. I've never used any of these, but if you're making some games or even non-game apps and you want them to be accessible to more and more people, then yeah, this sounds really awesome. You can really just use a single set of APIs and then make it work with pretty much any of these things. And then for audio, they've got a scriptball audio pipeline and enhanced audio foundation. So basically this is a framework that lets you extend the audio signal chain via burst compiled C-sharp units called scriptball processors. And then enhanced audio foundation, this is an improved and more flexible hardware abstraction layer that brings immediate benefits such as improved stability when swapping devices and higher quality sample rate conversion. Now for me, when it comes to audio in my games, I have to say I usually just stick with the most basic things possible. I never use FMOD or any of those complex audio tools that for me, really just stick with the most basic, so I don't really understand what all of this means. But there are some games that pretty much live and die based on the quality of their audio. So for those, I assume these are going to be some nice improvements. And then 603 also has some performance and profiling improvements. So first, there's an interesting profiler overview that provides simple statistical data views summarizing profiling data. Basically, this serves as an entry point for new users and gives quick preliminary advice for experienced users. So over here, if you go under analysis and open up the profiler, so then we hit on play and yep, so the profiler is now recording. So over here, we can now take a capture and over here on the capture list, we can see all the various captures we did. So we can load that data or take a bunch more captures. And if we can see a bunch of them over there, we see a nice little graph. And if we click on one of these, yep, it loads that data so we can see what happened on that point. Then this version also has URP bloom options for mobile. So it's some special filtering options designed mostly for small resolutions and large resolutions. Then improved batching for renderers with custom data. So new mesh renderer and skin mesh renderer shader user value to set per renderer unsigned int values. So I'm not entirely sure what this means. I'm definitely not a graphics programmer, but I think that improves rendering. Sounds like a great thing. Then URP intermediate texture. So apparently this is something where you can disable this pass if you don't need it. Then the Sprite Atlas Analyzer provides reports to identify common inefficiencies in atlasing. And then to the animation performance improvements. So refactored IK system for multi-threading. Caching the form of sprites, first from calling, optimized single bone mesh deformation, reduced bone data redundancy, and eliminated unnecessary C vertex transformations. So, yep, all sounds very complex and really nice. If you've never used the Unity 2D bone tools, these are really awesome. If you're making some kind of 2D game and you got a character, you can easily assign the bones, and that makes it much easier to create animations. So, if these are all on the 6.3 beta, you can go ahead and join the beta so you can download it right now. Now, like it says here, they do not recommend the beta for projects in production. So the beta is very much just meant if you want to try out all of these features before they come into an LTS. If you want to try it out, you can just go up on the Unity Hub, go under Installs, then install the editor. Then over here, go under Pre-releases and just install the latest 6.3 beta. So if that's Unity 6.3, the beta version currently out, and the LTS version will probably be coming out in the next few months. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.